Hello, Smart Money Tree Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kirk Chisholm. I'll be your host. And today I'm joined with my good friend, Doug Hagerin. Hey, Doug. Hey, Kirk. Happy Friday again to you as many, many times before and hopefully many, many times again. So Happy Friday to you, dude. You too, you. Doug. And uh, yeah, looking forward. We're actually getting some good weather here. I was outside. Did you say YouTube or did you say YouTube? Are you endorsing? YouTube, whatever. We're not talking about Bono here. So. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, this is great. We get some great weather and finally starts to feel like spring again. I'm, uh, I'm excited over here. Um, I actually wanted to start off. We're, we're probably, I mean, we do this thing called chart crimes, which I know we're going to talk about today. And um, also we do, uh, I'm a big fan of memes, uh, all memes, you know, it's like the new comedy that doesn't get any respect. It's like the Rodney Dangerfield of comedy, but I love it. And you got these people out there just putting out brilliant memes that, uh, um, that don't get any respect, but they make everyone laugh. So give, give people credit. There's actually two I wanted to share. One was not necessarily a, um, I mean, per se, but Elon Musk did it, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna share it here just because I thought it was uh, a brilliant. Ob- I'll, I'll call it an observation, not a uh, not a meme. And he shows a picture of the uh, the monopoly box, and it says how the Federal Reserve works. And I'm gonna read it to you, all all you listeners. It says, and the question on the monopoly game is, what if the bank runs out of money? The answer is. Some players think the bank is bankrupt if it runs out of money, but the bank never goes bankrupt. To continue playing, please use slips of paper to keep track of each player's banking transactions until the bank has enough paper to operate again. The banker may also issue new money on slips of paper of ordinary paper. I mean, <laughs> and his and his and his com- Elon Musk comment was like how the Federal Reserve works, and it's true. That's exactly how the Federal Reserve works. Um, but I, I just thought I'd share that. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, I give it to Elon. He's the uh, he, he's he's the king at, at putting out these sort of things. Also, in in the same vein of Monopoly, I wanted to share another one because I thought this was actually this was uh, really good. I don't know who did this. Uh, it looks like David Henning. Um, and and this one was it's a picture of Monopoly board and it reads Imagine playing Monopoly and never buying any assets or investments that generate income. Imagine you just went around in circles collecting two hundred dollars, giving your money to the rich, trying to stay out of jail. This is how most people live their life. <laughs> I mean, that's so brilliant. I mean, if you think about it, like if you ever played Monopoly and you never bought anything, you just went around in circles trying to stay out of jail. <laughs> collecting $200. Like that's how most people live. I mean, it's true, right? We all, we all go through life and we don't, I mean, not everybody, but a lot of people go through life. They don't own assets. They don't own real estate. The whole point of this is generally real estate. Um, but I thought it was a very brilliant um, uh, viewpoint on on um, just kind of investing in general. So I wanted to share those, uh, bring a little humor to this Friday, but um yeah, we also had, who do we have? We had someone else, we had another famous investor die recently, didn't we, Doug? Uh, wasn't uh, David Sanborn. I don't know if he's considered an investor, but certainly a famous saxophonist who played with many of the greats out there. But uh, Jim Simons, that's who it was. Jim Simons. Oh, Jim, Jim passed. I missed that one. Yeah, it's famous, famous investor, Jim Simons. Uh, I think his book was called uh, I forget what it was called, but it was like, uh, basically his claim to fame is he got like 70% returns a year uh, just by using math. Like this guy is like a math wizard. He hired a team of math wizards and he's made like ridiculous returns with like no down years. I'll try to pull up this, Doug, maybe Doug can pull up the stats or I will when, when Doug is mm-hmm. uh, talking. But um, this guy was just a brilliant investor and he was literally just a math genius. And he found a way to to win at the market. And, you know, now it's, it's kind of like, he was like the money ball guy of investing. And, um, now everybody does that, but he was one of the first and he was so secretive because he didn't want anybody to know what he was doing. Um, at one point he actually had to shut down his fund. He had to shut off his fund to new investors because it was growing too fast. I mean, imagine you're growing at 70% a year, right? It's like the old, um, the old story of, you know the 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 old peasant that took advantage of the king. He won a bet, and and every every day he doubled the amount of grains, rice grains he would get. And by day thirty, he was or day twenty five, he was like wealth, the wealthiest person in the kingdom, right? Something like that. I know we all heard that one, but the same kind of thing. If you're making seventy percent returns a year, 
at what point do you run out of things to invest in? Right. Warren Buffett says, if I only had 20 million, I would I would be able to hit like 50 to 100 percent returns a year as well. And he might. Right. But um, once you get so big, you, there's only so much you can do. And it limits it limits your tools you can use, because at some point you're as big as, a, as you know, you're bigger than Apple. You're bigger than a country. Uh, at some point, there's only so many things you can invest in. So, um, you know, RIP, uh, Jim Simons, he was uh, he was a brilliant one. And if if you guys haven't read his book, I'm trying to pull it. It's called uh, uh, Greg. Uh, okay. The man who solved the market is what it's called by Greg Zuckerman. For those of you who, who don't have it, uh, highly recommend it. Yep. Now I'm going to add, now add on to that. Cause you wanted me to find some stats. So he founded uh, Renaissance technologies in 1978. Did used his math models, which have now become exceptionally popular through what they call quantitative trading, um, which is now soared on wall street. But um, Renaissance uh, was able to use that quantitative analysis to create a gain of more than a hundred billion dollars on the flagship medallion fund, average an annual return of 66% before investor fees, which uh, ultimately between 1988 and 2018, uh, this is from Greg Zuckerman's book, wrote that wrote um, the man who solved the market, as you said, yes, but after fees, the gains were still 39%. Okay. So obviously charged a ton for his for his work, but yet still after fees net beat Warren Buffett, George Soros, Peter Lynch, and other investors over that stretch. Um, and you know, several years ago, the fund then got limited to Simons and his colleagues. So um, he, I think at, uh, at his death, he was estimated to be somewhere in the range of 20 to 30, uh, $31.4 billion. And he had given away about 6 billion to philanthropic causes. So, um, yeah, did pretty well. I think uh, selfish I guy only gave away 6 billion out of his 35. I mean, so selfish. Many people, many people <laughs> would claim that Kirk, that it was incredibly <laughs> selfish that he was just a wealth hoarder and didn't help anybody. <clears throat> Yeah, we should we should take his wealth, Doug, because we don't have thirty seven billion. He does, so it's owed to us, right? It's That's we're entitled right. to it. That's exactly <laughs> Isn't that how the world which, works nowadays. Which I think, if you do some of the mathematical, if you go back and look at the math, and this is not to get too political here, of some of the proposals for wealth tax, it wouldn't come up with as much wealth as many of the you know taken from that tax as many of these billionaires give away on their own to charitable causes. So it's like they're it's not like they're not already giving away a tremendous amount of wealth as it is by their own discretion. So just well, one of the things actually that, that I, I find interesting and I mentioned it last week in the show is that all of these bazillionaires give away money to nonprofits to charities, right? Mm -hmm. And they get a deduction, they get a tax deduction for that. You Huge. know, woohoo, good for them, right? Yeah. Um well, it's great for them. They get a they get a charitable tax deduction. It's great for the charity because they get some money. But who are they giving it to? And what what is the charity doing? Right. We talked about this uh, last time. Where you know, if you go to I, I forget what it's called. There was a uh, a rank a website. I mentioned it last time, but it basically ranks charities based on how much of the money actually goes to the underlying cause versus how much goes to quote unquote administration. Charity Navigator. Yeah, Charity Navigator. That's it. And so if you go through you know, where all, and this is the funny thing. It's like all of a sudden, like, oh, I gave a two, a, a billion dollars away out of my, out of my 35 billion. And, oh, well, he's a, he's a good guy. We'll leave him alone. We won't try to take his money. It's like, well, look, where's that money going? Sometimes it goes to a, a charitable foundation that happens to be run by their family, right? Which happens in a lot of really wealthy families as they create charities and they do other things with it. Sometimes they create like George Soros type of funds. I know everyone's on his back. Uh, about you know his quote unquote philanthropic uh, endeavors where he tries to basically change change politics and all that. So you always have to ask the question. It's never just like oh yeah they donated money to a nice person. It's like oh, where did they donate it to? Where did where did that money go to to benefiting people in general? Well, I'm all for charities, but I think you know once you get to a certain size, you should you should stop being a charitable organization. You start being a for profit institution, right? Like I think. Hospitals. I education yeah, think, like colleges like they should be paying taxes no question about it they have plenty of money you know I, and I think, not all of them some of them yeah and i think a great example I, I just want to bring up that a lot of especially the billionaires have been donating to is the bill and melinda gates foundation um and there's definitely 
much evidence around the world of, of work that they've done. And again, I'm not getting into politics. I know some people have their opinions, but interesting enough under Charity Navigator, it's not currently rated. Um, they're, so their ratings are calculated for one or more beacon scores. Currently, they require either an accountability and finance beacon or an impact and measurement beacon to be eligible for charitable, Charity Navigator rating. The absence of the rating does not indicate positive or negative, only that we've not yet evaluated this organization, which says something, right? So it's telling you, you know, in in this regard, we were a lot of billionaires have committed to that billionaire pledge, but we don't we don't have any real transparency internally as to what that foundation is actually, uh, you know, producing in terms of output versus its input. And and again, we've actually seen the work that the Gates Foundation has done around the world, unlike many of these foundations and charities. So there's certainly uh, certainly argument that there is a lot of positive that's happening, but compared to what they're taking in, it could be very small. It could be an extremely inefficient organization. They have not shared the data to be able to produce that type of transparency. Yeah. And, and, you know, not to get political, but I, I think uh, if you look at in this, this kind of gets into like taxes and, and, and kind of uh, tax strategies. You know, if you look at and, and I haven't done the research on this. A friend of mine has. So I'm, I'm kind of going a little blind here. So take this with a grain of salt. But, um, you know, from my understanding, a lot of the, well, all of the presidents, like when they have a library, like a presidential library, my understanding is that's basically a big slush fund. Is that, you know, people can donate to the library and the president can use those funds for various purposes. So it's it's basically like a, uh, a presidential slush fund that they can create afterwards. And so I, I don't know that to be true, but that's my understanding of it. So good or bad, I mean, whatever, they're the president, they don't make that much money. You think you're the president of the United States, which is one of the most important positions in the world. And you're making, it was like four or $500,000 a year. Like the, the, the Federal Reserve chairman makes like a lesser amount than that. I mean, when he, I mean, of course they, they all get paid afterwards, right? They get paid to speak like, Oh, I'm going to bring you on to speak to my company for half a million dollars for like half an hour of your time. So I, I know how all the world works, but it's, it's just interesting um, that all these things are set up and, and people don't seem to care. Um, but I, I would say that if people are concerned about um, where their funds are going, like, why, why are these people wealthier than me? Well, I don't know. Why don't you look at everybody and see, you know, where the funds are going? Like, you know, as they say, follow the follow the money is always a great indicator of intentions. So anyway, we'll stop that topic because uh, we, we don't want to really get into politics too much. Click, but click, click, I, click, click. I'm seeing them all sign off now. So. I know. I know. I, I just find it interesting. Right. I'm not making a, a comment whether it's good or bad. I'm just saying it's really interesting. Um, if you really kind of do the deep dive, you get to see where things are flowing. You're like, huh, OK, that makes sense. Like. This is why that person did this. this. Is why the person did that. Like, I try to be judgmental about it. I'm just like, yeah, it's interesting. Like, there's nothing I can do about it. So why am I going to get get my uh, uh, get my uh, pennies in a twist over here? All right. So um, I did want to one chart crime before <laughs> before we start, and I have to thank Doug for this. Um, here we go. We're going to start with a, a chart crime of the day. Um, here, here's a correlation versus causation right here. And and for those uh, audio viewers, uh, here's the um, here's the chart. It's basically comparing uh, median home price versus median household income in San Francisco, and it shows median home price skyrocketing uh, after 19, 1970. And and the and somebody put an arrow that said Led Zeppelin releases go into California. <laughs> In 1970, and since then, house prices have gone and skyrocketed. <laughs> Jimmy Page was the soothsayer, and Robert Plant was the preacher that led to this mass emigration into California. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy Page. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, Reminds me of funny. that South Park episode out there where uh, where there's the the mountain of the rock gods. But anyway, that's another story for another. I haven't time. seen that one. I've seen I've seen oh, almost all of them. That's a classic from early years. Oh, yeah, I'll okay. have to find that one for you. Yeah, please send it over. I, I love South Park. They're they're brilliant with their humor. I know it's uh, it's uh, adolescent potty humor, but I have to say I love it. Um, maybe that's the adolescent in me, but they are so they're they're another one that does that gets uh 
that doesn't get the respect they deserve for their comedy. Like they're just so sharp at where culture is. And if you watch some of the stuff, like it used to be very much potty humor and now it's, it's a lot more uh, ribbing like the cultural stuff that's going on now. Like they're really brilliant. I wish they would come out with more stuff, but anyway, is inflation getting you down? Do you feel like your money is worth less every time you open your wallet? Is shrinkflation frustrating you at the grocery store? Well, I have an answer for you. We're giving away free money. That's right, I said it, free money. I feel like I'm not doing my part to create inflation. Why does the government get to have all the fun? What could be better at increasing inflation than giving away free money? No, I'm not an employee of the Federal Reserve. And no, I'm not an employee of the US government either. And no, I am definitely not printing it myself. But it's free. What more could you ask? Well, you might ask, is it real? Well, yes, it's totally real. I'm holding my hands right here, see? Oh, wait, this is a podcast. You can't see it. Either way, I'm holding my hands right now and I wanna give it to you. If you want some free money, go to moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money to get your free money today. Follow the instructions and I'll send some to you. Enjoy your free money today. I'm not the Federal Reserve, so I only have a limited supply. This offer is good until I run out. Go to www.moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money to get your free money today. What do we got next, Doug? We got a whole bunch of charts you sent over. Where do you want to start? Well, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to talk about, um, I think this is almost kind of a, I don't know if I can call this a chart crime as opposed to, um, they're either both going to be a chart crime or they're both going to be, um, just, you know, not, but just con, you know, contradictory. So basically, um, sent over a post that, um, now that they are showing about 9%, of 1.12 trillion in credit card debt transitioned to delinquency status in Q1 2024. That is a hundred billion of credit card debt is now considered to be delinquent. Um, also 8% of the 1.62 trillion auto loans transitioned to delinquency status. Now, what I think is really an exceptional statistic in that is that student loan uh, delinquencies uh, or percent uh, have plummeted. And no surprise for that. I mean, I think that, you know, if we go back to 2020 and we look at a lot of the deferment pro policies that were happening there um, and, and cat, you know, income cash people were making, there was a lot of people trying to pay those down, but, um, and that one really hasn't started to recover, you know, or to, to bounce yet. It's still been st steadily declining. Although, as we've said on previous call, uh, shows that the, that the payments are now started about mid of mid of last year, um, or earlier that I forget exactly when I apologize, but the payments actually started back up on those that have been deferred for a while. So I don't know where that will lead, but interestingly, we are starting to see, um, uh, you know, credit card and auto loans since what looks like late 2022 have steadily gone up, it's gone up. Now there's a little bit you're seeing on mortgage, um, not nothing to really overly be concerned with. At this point, and and we've said this before, one of the reasons that if people do get into financial trouble, one of the last things that they are not going to pay is housing. Right? You can you can let your credit cards go, and it's a nuisance uh, to to get those calls, and things might start getting shut off. But at least you still have a place to sleep. Um, autos, you know what? It's a collateralized uh, situation, and you know what? They're going to come take your car in the middle of the night. But you you can figure out public transportation. Housing is a whole different story. What I thought was interesting was that there was also a post uh, that was kind of counter to another post out there that was by a gentleman who is is really a real estate bull, and so he was look he was actually responding to some a post that U.S. consumers have maxed out their credit cards, which the data that you're that, that we just showed might be contributing to that um, or correlating to that, but he posted another one about utilization. So yes, our credit card balances going up at absolutely they have, but overall he posted that there was a, a it's actually a little bit 
different in terms of the way you interpret it because since 20 around 2009 2010 uh with a sharp drop off going into 2019 into 2020 again a lot of people paid down debt the utilization rate of actually how much credit card debt is act is being used compared to the amount of balance that people have available is much much smaller so it's really been hovering right around the 20 to 20, you know, 22 to 24% range other than that kind of 2019 to, you know, dip out into 2020 and back up. We're back where we were. And as soon as it hit about 24, it start it looks like the chart starting to decline again. People are kind of maintaining around a 24% average utilization on credit cards, which again, that's not necessarily a positive that people are maintaining this consistently, but it hasn't gone up since you know 10 years ago um it, as an overall average and it's lower than it, where it was if we go back to what happened after 2008 2009 now i'm not going to profess this as a positive thing as i said if you're hovering with 20 24 balances on your credit cards and then you're looking at the rise of interest rates and looking at you know 25 percent interest rates of some of these cards that people are paying it is going to get a significantly more difficult ability to pay the interest payments on those because they will address adjust the minimums on those credit cards which is going to lead to other effects um or potentially lead to other effects because again you have less cash flow um the fact that we do have a lower utilization means that there may be larger amounts of credit that people have and again that's not a great thing it, you know yes the utilization is lower but and it means that people could certainly dip into their credit longer so longer, you know, pain for longer, right? But ultimately that that's not a positive because if you have that much utilization and you can dip into it, again, are you going to start dipping into it, which could have some real negative effects. But according to this, going into Q1 of 2024, the utilization rate actually went down a little bit. Again, you know, it dipped off of the high, a little bit of a high last year. Now, what, what I don't know is, does that mean that people were able to go out and actually get more credit or are they paying it down? So it's hard to say. Um, that dips into another and another kind of segue, which really comes down to, you know, the cost of, of looking at what the impact could be to our own, you know, our own government. If we look at the impact of interest on the Federal Reserve. So there's another chart I posted that they're looking at net interest costs and where we are. It's about 34% of federal revenues by 2054. So this is from Peter G. Peterson Court Foundation. Um, again, their, their chart only goes back to 2009. So it's not showing much of a history there, which would make me wonder. But knowing that interest rates have gone back up from the federal government, you know, after years of low interest, again, I think you have to go back quite a bit to see this spike at much at a higher no, note. So I think this is one of those where if we do look forward and not necessarily backwards, that's what matters here. There's been a sharp increase since 2020 in the interest costs against the federal revenues already going from, you know, say 2019, 2020 into 2024. They are projecting a, a, a little easing, it looks like slightly from 2025, 26, but then a consistently growing interest, a net interest as a percent of revenue. Again, if nothing changes, why am I bringing this up? Because at the end of the day, they got to get, you know, again, the federal government going back, it's all tying together, Kirk. It goes back to your monopoly money, right? If the federal government has the more flexibility to deal with the notes and issue notes and, and come up with money. However, they're still going to have to create a great, you know, create some way of, of doing debt service and still covering the other things. How are they going to do that? One way they might do that is raising taxes. By the way, if you don't think taxes are going up as of now, 2025 is going to be a potentially sizable tax increase on, on a, a good number of Americans because of the expiration of the Trump Trump jobs and IJ to Trump's jobs tax cut of that came out. I forget exactly the entire um, the entire uh, you know uh, title of that. But 2025 is set to sunset. Many of those provisions don't know if they're going to be able to uh, agree to do any you know significant extensions on any of those or not. Um, you're also I mean so again taxes are going up. There's one thing. What's another obligate thing that they could do? Well, 
There's a lot of people talking about that could put pressure on the Federal Reserve to lower interest rates because, again, you kind of have you, you kind of have um, you know a you know a, a personal effect of rate of having those high interest rates on our federal government. So there's definitely going to be some political conversations going on there. I don't know where it's going to go. Not making a prediction, just knowing that they're going to likely have to have some you know, some things that are going to happen in order to address the fact that federal interest payments, at least as of right now, are a significantly, potentially significantly greater, uh, uh, you know, service of their revenues. And they still have to pay for military. They still have to pay for infrastructure. They have to still have to pay for salaries. They still have to pay for everything the federal government still pays. But now they've got that rising interest. And many of you out there know exactly what that's like because you're facing it. Hence what we saw in those previous charts when credit card interest and other type of interest has been has been rising. The last thing I want to say, and I'll turn it back to Kirk because I, you know, just for give him some thoughts on this. Um, there is another chart showing that between 2020 and 2024, again, going into the pandemic, pandemic era excess savings rose to around 2.1 trillion in the height of August 2021 at its peak. We've talked about this. There, you know, those that track this have said there's been a, a steady diminishing of excess savings and we crossed over it in March of 2024. So now that excess savings where we were at an excess savings of 2.1 trillion, we're now at a excess deficit of negative 72 billion as of March 2024. So we've crossed over that. So if you don't have the savings and that's been carrying you and now you're turning to cover these costs. You have higher interest. And, and again, Kirk, I want to throw one more thing in there, if you don't mind, because it comes down to the fact that let's take a look at the price of a McDonald's meal over the last couple of years. It's just one indicator of, of the uh, effects of things. Prices have surged. So if we take a look at McDonald's prices from 2014 to 2024, um, it's really it's really interesting to see that the price is, you know, again, what's the best thing you could do, I guess, would be a four piece, a McNugget meal is definitely going to be the way to save money at McDonald's. It, as people have joked and what you may like McDonald's, it was always crummy food, but it was crummy food at a low price. Now that that advantage is gone. But if you do the math and if anybody knows the rule of 72, it's how long does it take for something to double based on its interest rate? So in that 10 year chart there, we are seeing that prices have effectively doubled over that 10 years. Okay. That's a 7% rate of return or 7% inflation on these items. And as we've said, even though the government says that inflation has been low for some time until, you know, we got into higher inflation post pandemic is, has inflation really been as low as it's been reported? And is it what's being reported now when you take out of the equation things that you don't have to buy, okay? And and do you have to buy McDonald's? No, but you do have to buy food, okay? So food inflation has been significant. Tuition inflation has been significant. Housing inflation has been significant. Utilities inflation has been significant. Again, people can't pull back from those things. So putting it all together, we are seeing that Delinquencies are going up on credit cards. Delinquencies are going up on, on autos. We are seeing that delinquencies are somewhat going up a little bit on housing. We're starting to see now that you know, excess savings is now in a deficit. Okay, Prices have gone up everywhere. Interest service has gone up. Again, now I'm going to let Kirk, you get to be the bearer of good news if you could think of anything. But all of these things come together, you know, as, you know, as, as a real, you know, a real, argument is okay okay if you've got credit utilization going back to what i said maybe it is lower maybe you've got more credit we need to watch that because if we start to see a pattern of credit utilization going up that's going to be the real sign of what the, the pressure that the american citizens are feeling well I, I actually do have good news doug for those of you who've not been paying attention uh this week uh very specifically this week from uh, let's see. Yep. Uh, May 13th and, and, and May 14th, very specifically, if you were not aware, uh, GameStop went, 
<laughs> went from secure seven, for all else, Kirk. Seventeen dollars up to sixty-five dollars and change. <laughs> now it's back to twenty. Uh, but for those two days, you could have been a hero too. <laughs> and uh, and also, it looked like some of the other ones. Uh, G, uh, let's see, G, AMC Entertainment went from like three dollars up to twelve. Woohoo for you too. Uh I think that was her I think GameStop was the biggest winner, but um I, I just I just have to laugh. As if nobody learned their lesson a few years ago from from the meme stock craze. It happened for two days, and if you missed it, you didn't really miss it. <laughs> well, and the timing's interesting because it's all the all about the time that um and I'm not going to say his name correctly on purpose. I believe it's Raging Pussycat or something like that. Raging came Pussycat. back, yeah, came back on social media. So yep. what effect he did that He didn't even have? come back. I'm he just back. posted a picture. No, yeah. he just posted a picture of him just leaning forward a in a picture. chair. And immediately yep. the, emotional, uh, the emotional short squeeze game was back on. You know, and, and it brings up the issue all this week. I've been hearing about short squeezes and it literally was two days and that was it. And um, everyone's talking about the short squeeze. I, I mean, honestly, why are you even touching stocks like that? I'm not saying they're good or bad because, you know, I don't want to get in trouble here. But, you know, if you look at history, if you see what happened and somehow you're still investing, assuming that's a great company, even though what a lot of those companies did was they waited, Hey, we, our stock was at two. Now it's up to like 200. Uh, let's go sell some shares. Let's dump some additional company shares onto the market. Cause Hey, why not? We can generate a lot of money. And, and some of those companies, brilliant strategy, right? I mean, if, if I was a company in trouble, I would love to create a meme stock craze that drives my price from $2 up to 200. And then I can sell, I can issue equity at $200 a share. And I could create like $100 million from, from thin air, uh, from, from a rabid bunch of fans that for whatever reason or not wanted that company, you know, generate a, a hundred or a few hundred million in, in new, new cash from selling shares. And then you can do whatever you want with that. Now it's a dying, you know, some of those have dying business models and let's be, let's be frank, they're dying business models. Now, maybe you like them, maybe you don't, I don't really care, but you know, going to an in-person movie theater at some point is going to be a relic, right? It's like the buggy whip. Yeah, there are still horses out there and there are still whips and there are still buggies. You know, usually the Amish drive them. But but generally speaking, those things are no longer a thing, right? So at some point you have to wise up and say, all right, you're, you're, the culture has passed by this, you know, this trend. It's time to move on. Um but to those of you who are still investing, good luck to you. I, I don't I don't even look at that stuff, but the fact that it hit the headlines is the only reason I'm even mentioning it. Um, anyway, so I wanted to mention that. And, and I also want to mention something else, which I thought was really interesting. And if you, for those of you who have not been paying attention, we are in a new bull market, right? People have been talking about we're in a recession, we're going to have a recession. We're on that list, right? We've been talking about that. We're like, oh, we're going to, you know, we uh, Doug mentioned that, um, trying to find the chart here where the stimulus runs out in March. Um, I saw a chart somewhere between March and May, but either way, the stimulus ran out and people are starting to feel it. And that's for sure. However, the markets are going higher. Now, why is that? Now, I've been wondering that myself for quite some time because I wonder like eh, markets don't seem to care. Like they, they, we seem to be floating around on plenty of money that just came out of nowhere. But where'd it come from? Right. The Federal Reserve's not printing money. You know, interest rates are higher. Both of those things should basically contract the money supply and effectively should also contract asset prices. Logically, that makes sense. Ah, but maybe that's not the case. Maybe the Federal Reserve is hiding something in plain sight that we are not noticing. Now, I'm going to point out a chart here that, that somebody shared and I thought it was really good. So I'm going to share it here. I've not done the deep dive, but this actually makes a lot more sense. So if you look at this chart, it's it's a Fred chart. If those of you don't know Fred, it's basically uh, the Federal Reserve of is it St. Louis. Uh, I forget which one, but one of the Federal Reserves has the Fred system. Um, 
and actually I'm going to, uh, I'm actually, sorry, I'm going to do this live. It's St. Louis. Yeah, it is. The Federal Reserve economic data from St. Louis. Uh, so, so basically if you, if you look at, if you, and by the way, for those of you who are economics geeks and data geeks, this is the best site out there. It is awesome. Uh, maybe the data is not accurate. That's not the point. This is a great aggregator tool and you can, you can like move stuff around. It's really good. Anyway. So what this person did was they, they put together all of the uh, liquidity and credit facilities um, available to banks and it kind of aggregated them all. And you can see here, 2008, nine and 10, there were a lot of funding programs that we all knew about. Right. And um, these were basically ways to put liquidity into the system. So the system didn't melt down. And it worked, right? You could argue whether it was a good idea or not, but, you know, it happened. All right. Fast forward to 2020, right? COVID happened. What did the Federal Reserve do? Well, they waited because they waited for, for things to melt down. Then they said, oh, we're going to climb in and we're going to do whatever it takes, right? We're going to buy your high yield bonds, right? That was actually something that they claimed. We're going to come in and we're going to buy high yield bonds because what they knew and what I knew and a bunch of other people knew is that the high yield bond market is actually a, a, a sloppy mess. And one of the problems is in the last, I don't know, 20 some odd years, the high yield bond market is, if you really think about it, there's the the, um, the treasury market, the corporate bond market investment grade, and then the corporate bond market high yield. The high yield bond market is actually really small. It's really not that big at all. Um, when you get to the investment grade corporate bond market, it's actually quite large. Treasury market, quite large. So imagine, uh, and I'm just making these numbers up because I don't have the real ones in front of me. Imagine that there are 100, there's like 100 million in the in the uh, corporate bond market investment grade. And there's 1 million in the high yield bond market, right? That is kind of similar ratios, right? Now imagine that 30 million of the, uh, of the investment grade uh, corporate bond market 30 million of that tries to shove itself into the high yield bond market overnight. Now, what's going to happen? Well, high yield bonds, the, the yields are going to go to zero because everyone's going to try to put money in there. Or what's going to happen is you're going to have more bonds in there for the same amount of people, which means that the price are going to go through the roof. Either way, it's not going to be good and it's not going to be, it's not going to be pretty. Um, here's the problem. And this is a problem that a lot of people have known for a while, so much so that people almost aren't even paying attention anymore. Here's the problem. If you are a, let's say, General Electric, okay, as an example, let's say GE, uh, I'm not going to use real companies, I don't want to get in trouble. Let's say ABC Company, right, Acme Corp, uh, assuming they're not a real company. Um, Acme Corp is a double, is a triple B corporate bond. Now, triple B is Still investment grade, which means it's the highest grade, which means uh, uh, pensions and endowments can invest in that, right? It's it's higher quality, quote unquote. Now, if you get to junk, that's uh, lower than triple B, which means it's very poor quality debt. So if you look at the, the investment grade corporate bond market, let's say Acme Corp is going to get downgraded to junk. So now you have, let's say, I don't know, let's say they have 100 million in outstanding debt. And they somehow, and now, they, now they're now they getting downgraded to junk. Well, here's what's going to happen. Every manager that owns Acme Corp uh, bonds now has to sell them. And now the high yield bond market needs to accommodate these new bonds by buying them. And so when you have this enormous portfolio of bonds going into this small portfolio, and there's less liquidity there to buy it, it means that the yield is going to go a lot higher because there's less money chasing the same amount of stuff. Um, so what happens is basically a lot of that instantly that that bond price goes down a lot uh, because of that big jump. And it's funny because the rating system goes from triple A down to C or D. I don't, I don't know. I mean, basically when it's in default, there's some other ratings, but basically if you look at that, that, um, uh, that system. If you look at that, like triple A to D, there's there's a um, you know there's shades of like what rating they are all the way down. But when you go from triple B down to single B, it's a huge jump, right? So even though you might say, well, it's just a small jump, no, it's actually a huge jump. And because you're called junk, and it, it, it a lot of these portfolios have to reallocate, so it's actually a huge problem. Now, in itself, if one company does that. 
Not a problem. The market can digest one company. But what if you have 30% of the companies making that downgrade? But now you've got a disaster on your hands. Now, what's happened, and also I don't have the numbers in front of me. I'll have to pull them up for next time. But what's happened is over the last 20 years, more and more companies have been downgraded to triple B status. I think it's like somewhere around like a third of corporate bonds are triple B, some like enormous number. And it's been growing every single year. So now you've gotten all these companies that have gotten downgraded, downgraded. So you got this huge bubble right, <laughs> right at the precipice of, of going to junk. And when COVID happened, what could have happened was all of those companies got downgraded to junk. And now you've got this huge tidal wave of crap that is being pushed in the junk bond market, which could very easily have imploded the whole financial system. Hey, hey Kirk, you can share the chart. I put the bond rating scale up there for you. Oh, OK, great. Thanks, Doug. Um, so I'm going to share that. So uh, here we go. Uh, bingo. OK, thanks, Doug. Yeah. So this is this is the ranking scale. So basically, as soon as you go over that barrier, it's not a small step. It's a big step. But each subsequent step in the side of investment grade versus non-investment investment grade, those are small steps. But that that line, the dotted line in the middle, that is a huge jump because you have to completely change the status of the debt and people have to like digest it. People have to sell it off and other people have to buy it. And so it changes it significantly. So the problem was in COVID is head that tidal wave hit because the global economic system was shut down, you could imagine how the rating agencies would say, well, actually, you're in tough shape. We're going to downgrade you. And they did that across the board. Now, if we go into a recession or a depression or whatever they want to call it this time, because no one wants to call it a depression, uh, the global financial crisis was a depression or they call it a recession. But if we have that happen again and it stays like Japan happened for like 30 years, if that happens... All of this debt is going to be downgraded and we're all going to be in real rough shape. And so what I say this because you need to keep in mind that that is a risk. Now, what ended up happening was, is the Federal Reserve knew that, as it, like I said, it wasn't a secret. Everyone kind of knew that, or not everybody, but people kind of in the know knew that. So if you had that, if you had that tidal wave and that happened, um, that would have been a big issue, right? So what the Federal Reserve did is they came out and said, all right, we're going to support the high. They, they said, basically, obviously, they printed money and gave it to a lot of people. Um, that was a big part of their liquidity program is giving out PPP loans, giving out EIDLs, basically just giving cash to everybody who they could. Um, but what they also did, they said, we're going to support the high yield bond market. We're going to buy any and all high yield bonds uh, that come about. It was, I forget their term, but basically said, we're going to buy any and everything we can. That immediately fixed the high yield bond market. That signaled to them that, all right, we're going to buy high yield bonds. And that supported it. They, I don't believe they actually ever bought any. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I, my understanding is they didn't, they never bought any high yield bonds. They just had to say they were going to buy them. And the whole bond market responded and said, all right, we know you're supporting it. We're going to buy it. We're not going to sell it. So that was a self-reinforcing system. The Federal Reserve is really good at the mouthpiece um, part of their job because they don't actually have to do anything. They just have to say they're going to do it. So if you look at that, obviously, there was a lot of liquidity created then. I understand. I mean, you could argue whether it's right or wrong. It doesn't matter. Now you fast forward to 2003. Uh, I believe it was in March when uh, SVB, First Republic, and Signature Bank went under um, because of the the, the raising, the rising in interest rates caused those banks to go under. Well, lo and behold, look at all these credit facilities that came online, right? And they're still up there. So if you're wondering why the stock market is doing well, I don't really know. Nobody does. But I could say this could be a very good indicator of why that's the case. Now, if you look at this, you'd say, holy crap, this is still more than is being produced by the global financial crisis, much more than COVID. And you'd be right. It is. It's a lot more. And somehow the market seems to be looking at this data and other data and saying, you know what? We are, we're pretty bullish that the markets can keep going up because a lot of liquidity being pumped in the system. And I feel pretty good about that. Now, I don't particularly like what's going on. I think it's dangerous. I think here's the thing that 
I'm going to leave this and I'm going to go back to Doug. Here's something to keep in mind. In the last 12 months, let's say, and probably for the next six months, you're going to see a lot of stuff coming out that says, hey, uh, this is a big change. For example, I think it was two weeks ago, Biden came out and said, we're pushing for a 45% capital gains tax rate. That's what he's pushing for. Do I think that's ever going to pass? Hell no. I absolutely think that is bunk. I think it's a stump stump speech, him to way to get, get attention. He got attention, but I think it's crap. I've seen this stuff over and over. Yeah, let's just hike up uh, taxes on everybody, on the rich. Yeah, let's get the rich. It's great for campaigning. In reality, that's never going to happen, right? It's just not. It, that's the truth of it. Um, however, if you are worried about it and you are thinking of selling your stock, what better time to sell your stock than this year before that gets enacted? Hmm. This might be a good time. Just saying. But I also don't believe that's going to happen. But if you don't want to take a chance and you're going to sell this year, next year, it might be worth considering. So just something to think about. Um, you're going to hear a lot of stuff in the next six months from Biden because he's a president, not because I'm for or against him, just because he's president. Right? Presidents do this when they're trying to get reelected. Um, trying to pay off more student loans, trying to tax the rich higher rates. I, you know, Doug said we're going to have higher taxes. I actually disagree. I don't think we're going to have higher taxes. I think they're going to find other ways to to milk the populace, one of which is they don't need higher taxes. They have they have the best tax in the world, the hidden tax called inflation. When you have high inflation, that is a tax in of itself. They don't have to say it's a tax. They don't have to say anything. All they have to do is inflate away the debt. That's all they need. And then they go print money. Oh, we have a deficit in the budget. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll just print money and cover that. And what do they do? They print money, cause more inflation. The debt gets worth a lot less. That's all that's happening. Everybody who's worried about higher taxes, yeah, they could go high, a little higher. But Biden's been in office for almost four years. How much How much has he raised the taxes from Trump? Eh, not very much, right? And if I was him, I wouldn't either, right? Who wants to be the, the person who's in charge of a, a, an economy that, that goes through the floor? Nobody does, right? Nor do I think Trump's going to lower taxes. Trump wants the economy to do well, too. So as long as those factors are in place, then you cannot expect that people are going to going to really pummel the rich at this point. Could they at some point? Yes. But inflation is doing a gr good enough job. And I think for all of you investors, and this is the takeaway for everybody, for anyone who's investing in assets, real estate, stocks, not bonds, but real estate or stocks, uh, you're going to see some appreciation over the next few years if this trend continues. As long as they have loose money policies, as long as they are trying to spike up inflation to deflate the uh, the debt that we have in this country, as long as that's happening, assets are the way to go. Leveraged assets. That's dangerous. I'm, I'm going to keep 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 this really tight. That is a very dangerous thing to do, especially with leverage. But that is the game plan for inflation. If you have inflation, you use leverage. The inflation inflates away the, the debt that you borrowed and you buy assets that are going to go up in value. That's the game plan. It's dangerous to use leverage. I'm going to say it again. It's very dangerous to use it. I wouldn't do it. But for those of you who want to know the game plan, that's what's going on in the markets. And that's one of the reasons that the markets are going higher. And that's one of the reasons why real estate keeps going higher. Because people are like, whatever, I own assets. They're going to go higher. I think it's dangerous because all it's going to take is one little bitty problem and the whole system kind of implodes. But for the moment, I think we can all agree that the markets are going up and there's really nothing on the horizon to stop them. And the CPI was was lower, a little bit lower. It, it, it was pretty much the same. I don't know why everybody's freaking out over a lower CPI. I still think we're going to have zero to one uh, rate drops this year, if any. I don't think we're going to have any, personally. But it's certainly possible we could have one. Um but I, I just I just don't think it's possible. I think they're playing games until election. Someone was like, oh, we're going to have a, a rate drop in June, and we're going to have another one in uh, November. No, we're not. What? right Or September. I was like, really? Right before the election? I don't think so. I, I, if they do that, they're just they're just crying foul and they're just a, they're just asking to get ejected from the Fed. Uh, if uh, if Trump wins and they do that, they're just asking to get get uh, get sent out of sent out on the, on the fast track. So I don't think they want to do that. I, I think, you know, they want to do the right thing and be nonpartisan, but who knows? We'll see. Doug, final thoughts from you before we wrap it up here. 
Well, yeah, thank you. I wanted to clarify one one thing. Um, I did not say that in general. I think taxes are going up. I'm just looking at next year. We we do have some taxes that will increase based on expiring tax act. And if they don't do anything, they are going up there. But I agree with you for the most part. Getting taxes, pa- getting new taxes passed. All you have to do is go back to 1990 and remember how that went over for George H.W. Didn't go over mm-hmm. very well. We don't like taxes. Nobody likes taxes. Even the people that go out there and say they like taxes don't like taxes until the tax, you know, once it comes down to whether it's going to hit them. So in general, I think that's the one of the last places that the uh, government will uh, will try to do, at least in a broad tax legislation. They'll get you in other ways more fees. And as you said, inflation, I think I agree with that very much. So um, I wanted to let you kind of tell people out there, we were talking about the rating system. There's actually a um, a site called wikirating.com. You can look at a list of corporations by credit rating. You'll be surprised by some and not surprised by others out there. I'm not going to throw any specific uh, uh, companies under the bus here. You know, I don't don't think Kirk wants to get sued, but um, these are facts uh, that there is, you know, definitely you'd be surprised at some of the companies out there and how low their ratings, their credit really is. Um, some of them are currently or at least have more recently been the darlings of Wall Street. Um, so when you look at them, how they're doing actually financially, um, clearly that is, not, you know, when we talk about fun- fundamentals versus technical, um, some of the darlings of Wall Street haven't necessarily shown that fundamentals is the reason that they're, that they're, uh, you know, hot. Um, the other thing, Kirk, you were talking about watch over the next couple months, again, not to get political, but as a great example, um, what, one of the reasons that presidents have a higher level of reelection as incumbents is they have the platform, they have the voice, they have the press secretary, they're able to get stuff out there. Notice that just a couple of days ago, it was announced that they want to move marijuana from a class one to a class three. If you don't think that the timing of that in election year might be politically motivated, hmm, it's certainly suspect. certainly suspect. Be aware, though, that even promoting that, I, there's things out there that say it could take up to 10 years to actually get all that done. There's so much bureaucracy behind that, but it sounds really good, and it's definitely targeting at a certain um, a certain uh, deli- uh, uh, certain voters in order to entice them to uh you know to be stimulated with the upcoming election or at least maybe but again it's suspect um other than that kirk i wanted to say thanks for having me again i know we're up on the hour um i did want to uh, just want to tell people uh we were talking about the rising costs we were talking about the cost of taxes listen what is the biggest fleecing of your money is going to be paying for college it is a tremendous tremendous i was talking to someone earlier today four kids Looking at public schools, that is not going not going out and looking at the hundred thousand dollar Princeton's of the world, which just crossed over. Looking at thirty nine thousand dollars a year for their first kid for a in state public school, that's a hundred and sixty thousand for one. And this gentleman has four of them. Okay, so you do the math, you're looking at half million to a million dollars of just college cost. He didn't get any aid for his first child. And, you know, if you're looking at those schools, you're probably not going to get aid for them either. So how do you get the cost down? You get the cost down by having a plan. You get the cost down by knowing the information. You get the cost down by planning today because there's a lot of ways you can save your wealth by not only getting discounts, but also by how you pay for college. And there's a lot of things you need to know that advisors out there are not telling you. There have been no, uh, numerous articles that have been published about how lack of college planning in your financial planning has turned out not only for lower income, but for the affluent. It is destroying their wealth, creating estate issues. Find out now. Go check out our website, mergentcollegeadvisors.com. That's M-E-R-G-E-N-T, mergentcollegeadvisors.com. Go there. It's a starting place to get really good information that you need to know today because this is one of the biggest financial and emotional investments you'll ever make. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, thanks Doug. Sir. And um, we're going to, we're going to wrap up the show here. That's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us in Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, Wealth Manager of Innovative Advisor Group. We don't just manage your wealth, we make your life better. You can find more about me at innovativewealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on this show.
You can also check out our show at Money Tree Investing Podcast. On our website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Please remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel for immediate access to the new shows when they're released. When you subscribe to the show, it allows us to get access to some of the top minds of investing in personal finance. While you're here, please leave a comment and question if you want us to address it on the show. Have a great week ahead. And remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life.